if you want the latest information on AI in photography software, this is it. Is it real or a gimmick? Does it work? And how best to use it? photography software. Stick around to the end because Jim is going to demonstrate how to use several AI programs. Welcome back, Jim. Always a pleasure. Well, thanks, Kirby. Thanks for having me again. So, uh, discuss uh, what is uh, artificial intelligence and how is it used in photography software in general. Artificial intelligence is machines having been programmed to be, quote, intelligent, end quote, or to, uh, again, in quotes, think like people think. Uh, they're, they're designed to solve problems, um, address issues that if people could think about it, we would do it. But instead of having like photographers uh, think about these things in terms of creating software or programming software, creating algorithms, the, the, the machines have already been programmed to do what we want them to do. And it's, it's, a, it's a brave new world. It's pretty remarkable what these brilliant software engineers can make their software do. In terms of photography, there's a lot of problems that we have, like, for example, noise. Noise is a big problem, much, much less now because of this artificial intelligence. Uh, when, when we do screen sharing, I wanna show you a picture, for example, that originally was unusable. A bird photographed in flight, in low light, and I used a very high ISO. Uh, in fact, let me let me tell you what it is right now. I used, um, yeah, <laughs> in an astonishing twenty five thousand six hundred ISO, and the, wow. the noise. The, uh, yeah, it's incredible. The, the noise was huge, like cannonballs. Plus, the bird was small in the frame, so I cropped it. I got rid of the noise, and I took a picture from being unusable you know you, you would never ever submit it to a publication you wouldn't even show it to your good friends uh, unless you were showing what could have been and wasn't and i took that picture using the artificial intelligence software and made it beautiful it's incredible which uh, software do you like for that topaz uh, the topaz okay. software is in, in my opinion, beside Photoshop, the best. Uh, they have several AI softwares. For example, they have Denoise, which it removes noise brilliantly. They have Gigapixel, which reses up an image. So if you have, let's say, a 60 megabyte file and the bird is small in the frame and you crop it down to you know, let's say 13 megs. So it's significantly cropped. You can take Topaz Gigapixel and res it back up to dizzying heights, basically um, 80 megs, 160 megs, whatever you want. And it it interpolates the pixels that you kept in, in when you cropped it and uh, gives you a, a high res file that that is in most cases quite impressive there's also a sharpen and so a lot of times you're using these things in combination so for example if you res up a picture maybe you want to sharpen it a little bit maybe you want to take away the noise and so the, the mostly these three uh, software programs from Topaz. They have others too, but Denoise, Gigapixel, and Sharpen are the three that uh, can take a picture that is, like I said, unusable and 
make it beautiful. Yeah, uh, it's pretty amazing. Uh, so when you uprise like that, do you get artifacts or anything that you have to worry about? Or? Um, sometimes. Most of the time, it's quite good. Sometimes there's a little artifacting. So then you might want to, like I said, apply denoise um, and, and some other things. But I would say 90% of the time, it's, it's very good. Um, it, another AI uh, software is now embedded in Photoshop. The, the recent version of Photoshop that came out about a month ago or so, or a month and a half by now, <clears throat> it's called Sky Replacement. It's found under the edit pull down menu. So edit Sky Replacement. And, you know, I've been re replacing skies for a long time. Uh, pretty much from the very beginning when I got involved in Photoshop in 1991, several years before layers were even introduced. And replacing the sky is easy sometimes. Like for example, if you have a cityscape or a building with all those nice, you know, sharp edges. But if you have a landscape with a forest or, or, a grassland with all the grasses sticking up in the sky, that's much more challenging. But in the last few years, I've developed techniques where you can deal with that, basically using layer masks. But now, uh, not in every instance, but in most instances, the sky replacement feature is so good that, you know, I, I shake my head in disbelief that, that the algorithms that are built into this new AI software, just how good they really are. It's incredible. It's really amazing what this new sky replacement feature in Photoshop can do. The brilliant software engineers who program the algorithms or who, who write the, the algorithms are unbelievable. I'll demonstrate a couple of sky replacement uh, composites and some of the very fine grasses that you would think would be impossible for Photoshop to distinguish between them and the background. Uh, it does an incredible job. So when, when we screen share with me, I'll demonstrate that. Okay. Sounds good. So uh, obviously you feel like uh, AI software is uh, is real and a definite improvement. Uh, I know there, initially when they came out, there were some skeptics that thought it was just a scam, but I think uh, the last year or so has kind of proved the contrary. It, yes, it, it has. It's, it's definitely not a scam. It, I'll tell you what, what it's done. And as a nature photographer, you'll appreciate this. There are so many situations in nature when the light level is very low. And if you have any kind of movement, whether it's trees blowing in the wind, grasses blowing, especially photographing birds in flight when you want to freeze the wings, horses running, anything like that, you have to have a fast shutter speed. And a fast shutter speed means that you reduce the light getting into the digital sensor. So either you have to compensate with a larger lens aperture, if you can open up enough, or you have to raise the ISO. Raising the ISO, of course, comes with noise. And most people are so hesitant to raise the ISO high, even though they need the, the fast shutter speed because of the noise. But if you can get rid of the noise, and if you can, you know, sharpen pictures that need to be sharpened, uh, crop small birds in the frame so they can end up filling the frame without destroying the image, that that that's a quantum leap forward. And so not when I'm shooting in low light situations and I have to have a fast shutter speed to freeze the wings of a bird, for example, because I do a lot of birds in flight photography. I don't hesitate now anymore. I mean, 
you know, would, would I rather use 100 ISO or 200? Of course. But if you can't, if you have to have, when I photograph birds in flight, the shutter speed I use is a 32 hundredth of a second. If possible, if there's enough light, I'll go to 4,000 with small birds because their wings move so fast. But a 32 hundredth of a second is fast. It lets in very little light. And, you know, if, if you're shooting in a forest situation or after the sun has set, you know, there's, there's still enough light to shoot, but not much. And you have to have that fast shutter speed. You know, now I'll go to 12,000, 25,000 ISO knowing I can make the picture, if not as, as good as 200 ISO, perfectly acceptable, beautiful, and most people would never know. So it, it's revolutionized uh, action photography. So do you, you shoot in manual mode then and use auto ISO or do you do all that yes. manually? Uh, no, I, I do exactly what you suggested. Um, but see, if, if you use manual exposure mode, you then choose your shutter manually, choose your aperture manually, and set the ISO on auto so, so the ISO varies based upon how much light you have. And as the light gets low and you know lower and lower as you're getting toward you know after sunset or or uh, in in a forest, the ISO will go higher. Some people put a cap on it, but I don't, and I don't for one major reason, and that is if you put a cap on the ISO and you're in manual exposure mode in a dark situation. The camera needs more light, but you're not doing it any more light. The AI technology has revolutionized action photography because you can have your cake and eat it too. In other words, you can have your fast shutter speed, relatively small lens aperture, and you don't worry about the ISO because you know you can deal with noise later. The when when you have your camera on manual, you choose your shutter manually, you choose your lens aperture manually, mm -hmm. and the ISO varies. And I don't cap it because if you put a cap on it, let's say I'm not gonna let the ISO go above four thousand. But if you're on manual, that means that you're, if you need to go above 4,000, but the camera can't do it because you locked that in place, your pictures are going to be too dark. Unless you compromise on the shutter or, and or you compromise on the aperture. So if the camera wants to go higher than, let's say, 4,000, you can slow the shutter down. So instead of a 32 hundredth of a second, you could go to a 2,000th or a 16 hundredth or a thousandth. But if you're shooting a bird, those wings are going to be blurred. And if you don't want the wings blurred, then you have to let the ISO go high. And that's why I never cap it. Yeah, that makes sense. It's... Uh... It's amazing uh, how much you can do now uh, like that, uh, particularly with the higher ISOs. Uh, oh, cameras have gotten better and the, and the software's gotten a lot better. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it, you probably were into photography when you shot film. And back then, you know, 400 ASA or ISO, 400 was grainy. And and most people wanted to stay away from it. In fact, I did all my nature and wildlife with a hundred. Well, well, nature landscapes with fifty ISO, and wildlife with a hundred, because I didn't want the the excess noise. And of course, back then you couldn't do anything about it. And so now to be able to use twenty five thousand, you know, it's just simply outrageous. Yeah. Yeah, I remember those days uh, very well. <laughs> so, uh, 
What other uh, AI software do you use? Have you used Luminar? Yes, I've I've used Luminar, and it's very good. But in my opinion, the new sky replacement feature in Photoshop surpasses Luminar. So I haven't used Luminar now for quite a while because the sky replacement is it's amazing and and easy, so easy. So. The AI software I use, uh, the Sky Replacement and, and Topaz, and at the moment, that's that's all I need. Okay. So uh, AI in uh, Photoshop also has some uh, other tools uh, like Refine Hair and Object Aware Refine Mode. Do you use any of those, or if not, why? Well, you know, uh, I can use them on occasion. But whenever you see them demonstrated, like on uh, YouTube, you know, the various tutorials, they always show a, a, a female model brunette against a white background or a blonde against a dark background. But if you're photographing models in a studio, yeah, you, you can do that. Of course, if you're photographing models in a studio, why not just use green screen? But in the real world, uh, travel photography, nature photography, the kind of photography that most people listening to, to this podcast want to do, uh, it doesn't work. If you photograph a person or an, or an animal, you know, against the background of a, of a forest, well, the software can't distinguish in the hair. To, to separate the hair from the background, um, you asked what other uh, software, AI software I use, and there is one more. It's a, it's a Topaz filter. It's called Mask AI. It used to be called um, was it, uh, Topaz, um, what was it? Gosh, I, just, I forget right now, but it's now called Mask AI, and it, it's the only thing that can consistently separate hair from the background. It's not perfect. If the animal or the person has ultra fine, wispy kind of hair, it usually can't get that. But the main body of hair, it'll get. And I, I can show you some examples of that as well. Um, okay. Again, it, it's not perfect, but it's the only thing we have uh, that that can deal with tough backgrounds. Uh, can you replace the background and then use something like that, or that doesn't work either? No, no, you 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 can't do that. Uh, okay. I, I do I do replace the backgrounds, but there's a tool. In Mask AI, there's a blue brush, and that is the tool that you go over the edge of your subject to tell Photoshop, here's the border, here's the demarcation line between subject and background. And then the software does its best to separate them with a selection. You can go in and tweak it. If, if it uh, doesn't do it perfectly, but there are some situations that are just so difficult. I mean, for example, you know, a, a white polar bear against a white sky. That's tough for the software. Or um, a, a black wolf against a very dark forest background. It's very difficult for the software to distinguish that. And sometimes a shadow, for example, will blend with the black hair so the tones are so close that you can hardly see them with your eyes. And so how can the software know where that, you know, one ends and the other begins? So there's all kinds of situations, but for most circumstances, this AI software is, um, well, like I said, revolutionary. Well, why don't uh, we go ahead and share your screen and uh, let's uh, see some of this in action. Okay. 
So let me push this. Okay, so here's my screen. So let me open up a picture here. I'll, I'll start with this one. This is an elephant I photographed in Kenya, and I've always liked it because the road was in, in, a, in a bit of a depression, which put us below eye level uh, of the elephant, which, which gave this animal greater stature. But of course, the problem is the white sky. You know, it's just, it just doesn't work. So up to now, or uh, up to this recent version of Photoshop, I was replacing the sky with a, with a, a layer mask. And if, if you want, Kirby, I can demonstrate that. But And it always did a great, great job. It was the only thing that we had, because if you look at these out-of-focus grasses, for example, you know, there's just no hard edges there. They're out of focus. They're semi-translucent. And there's absolutely no way, way to make a selection with the pen tool, the magic wand tool. Uh, so the layer mask technique was the only thing that worked. But now with the new sky replacement, let me show you. It's under edit, sky replacement. Very simple. So I have loaded into Photoshop my own sky backgrounds. Here is one of them. So before I talk about the picture, let me just say Photoshop comes with stock sky backgrounds, but everybody has access to them and you don't want to use skies that everybody else is using. So you want to put in your own skies. So if you click on the, the, the sky image right here, I'm going to click here, and now you get, here, here's all my skies that I put in. So all you have to do, if you click on it, like the skies that come with this software, you click on it once and hit the trash can and, and it deletes. I, I, I clicked on it and so it just put it in there. So if you click on it, there's also a little plus down here. If you click the plus, you can then upload your skies. So all of these are my skies. And, you know, sometimes the sky will work and sometimes it doesn't. Because if you look closely at this area right here, it's not very good. And so, so you, you try an, another sky. So I'll click on it and let's try this one. That's really good. This looks completely natural and it works. You can actually click on this little move tool thing and then move this up a little bit. So for example, you see where the dark clouds come over here, you might want to just come up like that. And now, now these little, grasses are exactly like they look in the original but now you have a great sky you also have sliders here where you can um, move them and and it, it adjusts the background to help you blend with the original picture so you've got those you can click flip here and it'll flip it left to right like that sometimes you need that um, the little preview button here, you can turn the sky off and on. So you see, here you can see how nicely defined these grasses are. And I put that sky back in, and it's virtually the same. So. That is truly amazing. It, it is amazing. Now, l l let me let me show you, let me cancel this out and show you a picture where the AI is not as intelligent as people. So here's a, a rosy spoonbill from Florida. We have a sky here. We have out of focus trees. And here, if I want to replace the background, see, you can replace this. If I replace the sky, well, here, I'll do that. And I'll show you what the problem is. 
edit sky replacement and here I'll, we can just keep the same sky photoshop puts in the, the sky that was here so that's a reasonable sky but there's a problem the problem is the bird is sharp the trees are soft and the sky is sharp no lens that we use in our cameras is going to do that photoshop actually blended the new sky with the out of focus trees perfectly absolutely perfectly but you can't have sharp soft sharp in fact let me turn on my little here now, now there's a red circle around my cursor people can see it better so the British sharp, the trees are soft, and the sky is sharp, impossible. So Photoshop didn't realize that. So you can't use the AI software or the sky replacement if you want the entire background replaced. Then you have to go back to Photoshop and, and you know select the bird or select the background and then uh, copy and paste. So here's so one. No Go There's ahead. no way to uh, blur or soften the sky. Oh, yes, you can. That would be a solution. Absolutely. When you use a telephoto lens, like I shot this with a 500, uh, the, the, the spoonbill, the sky background is going to be out of focus no matter what aperture you use, unless the bird is really far away. But if the bird is relatively close, you know, 50 feet, 100 feet, and you're using a 500, the background is going to be soft. So there's there's a technique that I have been doing. Uh, let me let me bring it um, where I've been combining birds in flight with sharp backgrounds. And to be honest, it's, it's, it's what we see because we never see out-of-focus backgrounds. That's a man-made construct. Mostly when you shoot birds, you have backgrounds like this. You know, that's, that's not bad, but it's not great. Uh, even even this, this background is okay. Um, so let's see, here's a, this is from the Pantanal in Brazil. It's a capped heron. The background is, shall we say, uninspiring. So let me take a moment here to turn these. Okay, here, Th this, this is one of the backgrounds I replaced. So, and this is coming, I'll come full circle to your comment about you could make the clouds out of focus. A very, very unique look is bird in flight and a sharp background for a couple of reasons. It gives a sense of place. It gives a sense of depth. And in our photographs, we don't see this virtually ever because we are always using a telephoto lens and usually a long one. So. Our backgrounds behind birds are always out of focus, and you know that's fine in a lot of cases. But look how look how different this looks. Let me show you another one. If I can find it here. Okay, here. There's that capped heron. Instead of a, a mud cliff background, we have a beautiful landscape. And this looks almost unnatural because we have gotten so used to the man-made construct of out-of-focus backgrounds with telephotos. But if you were standing there, this is what you would see, a sharp bird and sharp background, because with our eyes, we never see out-of-focus. So uh, there's one other one that I want to show you here. Okay, look at uh, Here's a capped heron in flight. It does go out-of-focus back here, but this bird was photographed against a very busy jungle environment because it had just taken off from a branch. So that is a look 
that I really, really like. And so getting back to your comment about the, the spoon bill, what, you know, could you make that back and out of focus like the trees? Absolutely. And that would be legitimate and perfectly fine and, and a, probably a very nice picture. But if you can put a nice background in there, you, you just sit back in your chair and you go, wow, that's incredible. So that's my long answer to your question. I think in uh, Luminar, when you do sky replacement, that you can uh, blur the sky or change the, you know, the brightness and the density of the sky and that sort of thing. I don't know if you can do that in Photoshop or not. Oh, yeah, you, you can. Absolutely. Uh, easy. Um, I can I can demonstrate that if you'd like. Um, but but let me let me show you right now more of the AI capability. Here's a picture. This is a a female honey creeper from Costa Rica. You can see the little edge of the corner of a table. It was coming in for the, where, where there was some food placed for the birds. This is twenty five thousand six hundred ISO. You can see the noise now, but it, but look look at it. It's horrible. And if you look at the picture here, it's just unusable. You know, you you would you wouldn't show that to your worst enemy. Look at that. Terrible. Okay, let me show you. Here, let me grab the after version. Um, okay, here it is, there. Okay, so here is the version. Look, look, look at, wait, let, let me blow this up. Here's the original. And here's the Uh, version after I applied gigapixel, because if you look at the bottom here, can I magnify that? Yeah, see, 83 megs. And this one, let me see, when I cropped it, So that's, that's cropped down to here, 11 and a half megs, and this is 83. Look at the, the look at the detail here. Yeah. You see that? I, it, and, yeah. And if you look look at here, look at it, it's 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 horrible. It's mush. So I res it up with uh, gigapixel AI. And then I sharpened it with sharpen AI, and then I took away the noise. I, I th actually, I, took, I think I took away the noise first with denoise AI. So three different Topaz programs took this picture, which is useless, to this picture, which is beautiful. And and by the way, you can see. Right here with the, with the tips of the wing feathers, my shutter speed here. Uh, let me double check. Was oh okay, it, it was a a twenty five hundredth of a second. Usually I use thirty two hundredth of a second, but as you can see, it was so dark because because I'm at twenty five thousand six hundred. And my camera wouldn't go hot. Well, the camera I was using at the time wouldn't go higher than that. So um, I had I had no choice. I had to lower my uh, shutter speed to 2500. And the price I paid was blurred wings. Now, some people, clients have said to me on some of my tours that they like when the wingtip feathers are blurred because it suggests motion. OK, you know, that that's a subjective uh, viewpoint. I don't. I think it's just intriguing when we can see birds in flight sharp because we, we can never see that with our eyes. Cameras can reveal something to us in nature that you know is beautiful and fascinating, 
And there's just no way we can see it with our eyes. So that's why I like it sharp. But but that's that's the price you pay when you compromise on your shutter. And sometimes you just have no choice. I hate to keep using the word amazing, but it is it is, it is truly amazing. It, it, yeah, it, it is amazing. Um, and I, I here let, let me show you another picture. Uh, this was taken. I do a well, except for this year because of the lockdown. Um, in, I go to Canada every year and photograph snowy owls and um they're, they're just magnificent birds and i use the same let's see where is it here uh i use the same settings 3200 and i i, I choose my aperture to be f11 because birds have depth i want the whole bird sharp and let me see. I got to find it again. Okay. Let's see. Uh, here is the original. So what, what what was happening here is it was getting late in the day. It was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon in January. So it gets dark early in Canada. And we were just finishing up shooting the owls. and. I had, so remember I talked about, I did not cap my ISO. It, so the camera's on auto ISO, manual exposure mode. My shutter was 32 hundredths of a second, and my aperture was F11. I had not noticed that the ISO had crept up to 12,800. And as you can see, there's noise there. Not as much as the 25,000, but still, there's quite a bit of noise. So then, let's see. Okay, here. Here is the after version, after I applied the AI noise reduction. Look at, there's no noise at all. And the bird is still sharp. I mean, if you look at the background forest, you know, noise shows up mostly in dark areas. Well, this is very, very dark. And it looks like I used 200 or 400 ISO. And it was 12,800. Now, there are some cameras that produce more noise than others. I have a picture taken... Um, in Africa, in very low light, same settings, and the ISO was it was only it was four thousand, only four thousand. I say only because compared to twenty five thousand, that that's nothing. And the noise was so big because I was using the Canon Seven D Mark II, and that camera really should not be used with any ISO settings over a thousand. But I had no choice. It was dark and I wanted my fast shutter speed. So let's see if I can find it for you. Okay, so let me show you another situation where this AI noise reducing or eliminating software was so good. This picture was taken with my Canon 7D Mark II in Africa. It's a bee eater. And if you blow this up, it's terrible. And the ISO I used here was 4,000. So this camera should really never really be used at above 1,000 ISO or else you're gonna get into this kind of problem. If you blow this image up, look at this closely. Not only is there a lot of noise, you, you know, like in a clear, uh, I mean, a, a smooth area or a monochromatic area, you can see it here very clearly, but there's no detail. The noise actually obscures the detail. And I really like the picture, 
because it's a bee eater in flight and they're very fast and very hard to get. The background, of course, is terrible. So here is the same picture after I replaced the background. But if you look at the bird, it's still not great. But it's the best this could do in this situation. And I, the point I want to make is that if detail is lost, like in this original, lost because the, the noise is so offensive and so so coarse that the software cannot give you back detail that was lost. But what it can do is smooth out the, the appearance of that noise so you have a halfway decent picture. Yeah, yeah, there are some situations where the noise is so coarse and it obliterates the, the underlying detail so much that the software just can't fix that. You know, if, if, if you look at this picture like this, it's, it's okay. But if you look at it closely, um, the, the, the detail has just not been replaced because the software doesn't know what was under that, all that coarseness. So most cameras, though, that's, that are using a reasonable ISO can be made a lot better. So I just wanted to make that point. So let me demonstrate how to use one of the Topaz software programs. Uh, in this case, I use Denoise. Um, you can access it either through your filter pull-down menu or when you load the software down in the dock, uh, you can see uh, this is Topaz Adjust, Denoise, Gigapixel, Sharpen, and that's uh, Topaz Studio, and so on. So Denoise, so this picture here, you can see, has quite a bit of noise. And this was, this was the one taken at 12,800 ISO, I believe. Yep, 12.8. You can see it right there. So what I would do is click on Denoise and sometimes Topaz makes you work on a TIFF only. And let's see, this is gonna be one of them, yeah. Okay, so what, what I have to do is close that and resave this. I'll go file, save as, and I'll save it as a TIFF file. It would work on TIFF or JPEG, but I never use JPEG files when I'm doing serious editing. So now it'll recognize it. So I go to noise. Can you use that as a plug-in in Photoshop or Lightroom? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll browse and see see now now it's accessible because it's a, it's a TIFF. So I click on it, I go open and I just let it do its magic. Um, I'm on, I'm on denoise AI. I'm on remove noise. And as you can see right here, it, it did it already. Um, you can enhance sharpness at the same time if you want, uh, or not, you can do the sharpness later. So if I reduce the sharpness a bit, uh, and you have other choices here, but to be honest, that that's all you have to do. Um, you have other low light functions and AI clear, but I just use the noise AI. It does a brilliant job. It shows you here 
where it's being applied. You can move this up into the dark areas and you can see, look at the noise just disappeared. And yet the bird is still very sharp. So I go save image. Uh, the color profile, I always output to um, Adobe RGB, not sRGB. You have a bigger color gamut with Adobe RGB. And TIFF is fine. Um, just go save. And it puts the picture on, well, wherever you want to save it. And I save everything to my desktop so I can find it. Let's see, where did it put it? Should have, there it is. Okay, so let me open the picture to show you. And let me blow it up. And you can see no noise at all. And yet those eyes are still very sharp. And the, edge, the, the edges of the feathers still very sharp. So that's how you use it. it look, looks to me like the uh, bird is actually sharper too after the denoise. Well, well, I, I added a little bit of sharpening, uh -huh. and yeah, in in that software. So that so all of the programs, the Gigapixel and the Sharpen, it's the same thing basically. Very very few choices, uh, and it, it's very user friendly. Okay. okay, so look, let me demonstrate how to deal with hair. And again, remember that this is not absolutely perfect, but it's the best we've got. So here's a polar bear I photographed in Canada on one of my photography tours. And notice something about this picture. You, the, the bear is sharp, the foreground is sharp, except for this little piece right here. and from about this point right here to as it goes back into the picture, the depth of field gets less and less. And of course, the same thing over here. So if I'm going to put a back, if I'm going to replace this background and, you know, m most photographers would be very happy with this picture, say there's nothing wrong with it at all. The autofocus background directs all the attention on the subject, which it does. You know, these rocks are here, but okay, that's just how it was. Um, but I want to show you another way of handling this, uh, similar to what I was showing you with the birds before about having both foreground and background sharp. So I'm going to open uh, Mask AI, Topaz Mask AI with this. So see filter, uh, Topaz Labs, and here's Topaz Mask AI. Here are your brushes. And again, the green represents the area that you want to keep. The blue represents the border between what you want to keep and what you want to replace. And the red represents what you want to replace. So I'm going to make a smaller blue brush. Uh, you, there's a slider, uh, let's see when you choose the blue, I don't know where the slider is, but you can, you can increase or decrease the size of the brush with the bracket keys. So what I do is, first I have to define at the edge of the ice where the sharpness starts to fade away, which is about right here. And then I think about right there. So I'm gonna draw the line and go up around the edge of the bear. I'm not pressing the shift key, not pressing any key, just dragging this around. And I think I'll come down to the edge of that ice right there. Now I want to get inside here. 
because that this area is out of focus, so that has to be replaced too. And we'll go inside here. Okay, that wasn't hard. Now we have to fill the areas that we want to replace with red. And it, the paint bucket is you click on it, it expands, and now you click on the red and just go click in here, click here, not holding on any keys at all, click there, and click there. So this defines here, let me, you have to make sure that your blue goes all the way to the edge. Okay. Um, the mask mode down here, I find AI to be the most accurate. And so that I leave it on AI. And all you do is go compute mask. And Topaz does its magic. Apparently, you don't have to be real precise with those blue lines, huh? No, you don't. I mean, there are some areas with ultra-fine hair. You can make that brush smaller, blow it up, and try to be as precise as you can. But generally, you don't. So here is the mask. And you can view it in different ways. Um, you can have uh, four panes, so you can see it against the original, what you did, the transparent against black. Uh, black is probably the best. You can see um, the hair defined here and so on. So if, if you accept it, then all you do is go apply. If you want to tweak it, so for example, um, if you click on zoom and let's say go 200% um, well maybe 100% there so you can you can look at the edge critically and see if it needs any tweaking so okay here see right here the black is bleeding into the white. So you see the fine hair here, but you, you don't want the background to come into the polar bear. So you could click on the green brush because the green is what you want to keep. With the bracket keys, make that really small and just touch right, right here. Uh, sorry, uh, not the brush, uh, the, um, the bucket the green on the bucket. And so we're going to, because, because we're going to pour the color, hang on. Um, there, you see what it does? You just touch it here. Whoop, that was too much. Want to make the brush really small. It should do it right away. Oh, it, there, there it goes. Okay. So this is how you can tweak. In other words, get, get the dark away from the white like that. So once you're happy, you can go apply. Okay. In the layers palette, here's your selection. And here's the original background layer. Topaz gives you a new layer here and you, you can't see any selection at all. In order to bring the selection to the forefront, you hold the command key down on a Mac or the control key down on a PC, one click, and it brings the marching ants to show you where your selection is. So right now the bear is selected in the foreground. We want the background to be selected because we're gonna replace the background. So you go select inverse. Okay, so now just to show you, if I take my brush tool 
I can brush here, but it won't go on the bear because only the background is selected. So now I'm going to take this picture here and copy this to the clipboard. So I go select all, edit, copy. Now I'm going to go edit, paste special, paste into. Into what? Into the selection. And there is the background. Now, for, first notice that, that, that it's a pretty compelling background. This, this, is, this is Hudson Bay. This, this was actually behind the bear, but, but I shot the bear with a 500, and so there's no way the background is going to be sharp. To match the foreground with the background, I would take out some of this blue, but the point right now is to look at what it did with the hair. That's pretty good. Let's look over the whole surface. Look at that. Incredible. Here it got a little mushy. So using the clone tool, you could maybe, you know, clone a little bit out here, you know, like some of this haze kind of stuff out. A little bit hazy here. Really, really good here. Very good here. Very good all throughout here. A little bit mushy here. A little bit hazy here. So you could go back into Mask AI and try to tweak these areas like I showed you. Uh, or you could use the clone tool. And you can also, you could copy and paste. So for example, you could take the lasso tool and copy this section of hair right here and then put it over an area that got a little mushy. So these are some of the tools that you have to use if the composite isn't perfect. But as you can see, most of the periphery of the bear is really, really good. Very impressive. Kirby, what do you think of the uh, AI ability to reveal the, the the fine detail of the hair at the edge of the bear. Yeah, it's really impressive. It, it is impressive. And again, it's not perfect. Um, and if you do with a person, you, you, you get the same results. You, most of it's very, very good. But if there's, you know, flyaway hairs that are just really fine, um, it, it it might not capture all of the hair that you want, but there's nothing else that we have that's as good as this. Yeah, I think most people would be very satisfied with that. Yeah, I I, I would think so. So, um, and 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 as a result, you have a, a picture that's you know pretty interesting. If we, if we go if I go file revert. Look at the difference. Here, here you have, uh, oh, um, you know, with with the the background there, you have the environment. This way, you have just the bear. So it depends on what you want, but it's a really cool uh, technique. Here is a different bear, and as you can see, I drew my blue line along the edge of the snow here because that that's well. That's what's sharp, except look at this closely. That's this area right there is soft. And so this actually has to be cloned out because you can't go from sharp air to soft to sharp background. So I, I didn't notice this the first time around. So what I should really do is just take this out. And now you don't have that telltale soft area. There. Jim, where can people find you and all you do? 
tell everyone how to sign up for your excellent monthly magazine. Well, my, my uh, website is jimzuckerman.com, and at the bottom of the homepage, there's a link where it says sign up, and it's a free monthly e-magazine, and it features articles on photography and Photoshop, um, inspiring techniques. At least I think they're inspiring. And um, I post every day on Facebook, Instagram, and on my website on the blog area of my website it's all the same post but i post every day and talk about how i got it and the technical aspects of getting the various pictures that i take and what do you do in your spare time <laughs> well you know when before the covid problem and, and i was traveling so much people always said that you know how, how do you do all the stuff you do well my my classic answer is sleep is overrated <laughs> so so I, I i work all the time but yeah. you know I, I i love photography i'm always making new pictures and talking about them and i just never get tired of it uh, i've been doing this for 50 years and just i still have the passion that's great well, thanks for being on the Photographing the West podcast again. I always learn a lot when you're on, and I'm sure our audience does too. Each episode is published on the 15th and 30th of the month, except next month, of course, when we'll bring you Adam Woodward on the 15th and Joe McDonald on the 28th. Bye for now, and we'll talk soon. <laughs>